things in that kind of party. We're going to get some of these boo hooers in there. <laughs>
Good morning. We are a chatty bunch this morning, which is all right. Good to see everybody. It is a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Great to be with everybody here as we worship our Lord and Savior together. Those that have joined us in person, as well as those that are watching online. Good to have everybody here with us. Uh, if you look inside your bulletin or a couple of things, you have this purple bookmark, which lists for you all the stuff going on here uh, during Lent. It's got our Bible studies on here, our Lenten uh, Lectio study, which will take place here on, on, uh, around noon or so. Uh, on the back is what's going on during uh, Holy Week, starting with Palm Sunday, going all the way through, uh, through Easter, so do take a, a peek at that. A few brief announcements, though, that I want to make you aware of, and the announcements are in the other insert in your bulletin. Uh, just a big thank you for everybody who participated in and helped with a room at the end this week. Uh, we covered meals there from Sunday, I think, all the way to Friday night. So it was good to have all the participation that we did have. So thank you to everybody who participated there. Thank you also to everybody who came out and supported the uh, Fat Tuesday pancake dinner we had this past Tuesday night. Uh, thank you to all the men who uh, cooked uh, in the kitchen, all the youth that helped serve the drinks, everybody that came out and made a donation. Uh, it was good to be together uh, as a family having a meal, wasn't it? Uh, good to see the fellowship hall uh, full, so thank you for that. Um, if you are part of the Just Older Youth group, and that's almost, I don't know what, you know, I think it's north of 40. Uh, I'm not going to say how far north, but uh, way far north. <laughs> Uh, they are having an outing on St. Paddy's Day on March 17th. It'll be at 6 o'clock at Bass Nights. Uh, Sign-ups are outside of the church on a sheet, or you can call and tell us that you're coming. But they need to know by next Sunday, the 13th, because they got to get the numbers over there by Monday, the 14th. So if you have an interest in going and need more information, see me, see Joe, see Marcia. Make sure you sign up, though, between now and next Sunday, the 13th. Uh, also, if you are interested in participating in our 8.30 survey questionnaire, they're still floating around. There's a couple over here, a couple over here, some in the narthex, so do take a look at it, fill it out, and get it back to the church as quickly as you can. Uh, this week begins our Lenten studies. Uh, so like I did by email and on Ash Wednesday, I want to give you real quick the homework for those that are participating. If you are doing our He Chose the Nails study at 10.30, you need to read the first three chapters by the time we get to Wednesday at 10.30. If you're coming from the Lectio at noon, you have no homework, right? That night at 7 o'clock, if you're doing the Jesus-shaped life, you should have finished day 7 by that time. And if you're doing the forgiveness study, guess what? There's also no homework for you that, day, that time either. So if you're participating, uh, those, that's your homework assignment. If you need child care, let us know, and we'll try our best to uh, provide that for you. Um, what else is it? I think that's it. And I think that's plenty. So let us get our hearts and minds together and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious and Holy One, we give thanks to you for giving us this time and this opportunity to come together as your beloved sons and daughters, whether here in person or online, to spend a little time together in worship of you. We give thanks to you, Lord, for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is here with us. And we ask that you open our hearts, our minds, our ears to the words that are either sung or spoken today and in what ways are they giving us a message. As we begin this season of Lent and we start to take stock of our lives, show us, Lord, those places that need to be straightened and those places that need to be strengthened. We thank you for your never-ending mercy, grace, love, hope, and joy that you give us. We particularly give you thanks for blessing us with the Savior we all so desperately need that you sent to us. And it is his name that we all say, amen. Friends, I want to invite you now to stand as you're able and join me as we sing our opening song, Man of Sorrows. Hmm? Oh, sorry, sorry. Sit down. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sound a little bit like Coach K there, didn't I? Sorry about that. That's right. Let's get our hearts and minds now ready for worship.
Well, friends, now let me ask you to stand as you're able. And join me as we say together our call to worship is found on page 810 of our hymnals. We'll also go over to page 811 for a little bit. But we'll start on page 810. It is Psalm 91. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence that will cover and will cover you with his pinions. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. A thousand may fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your habitation. For God will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. Because they cleave to me in love, I will deliver them. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. Friends, I invite you to remain standing as we sing our song of praise, Man of Sorrows. sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, a sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. My soul cries out, Alleluia, praise and honor unto Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full, 
by the precious blood that my Jesus filled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. When the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Oh, that larget cross, my, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Alleluia, praise and honor unto The stone is rolled away, behold the empty tomb. Alleluia, God be praised, he's risen from the grave. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me Now my soul cries out Alleluia Praise and honor unto thee Praise and honor unto thee this time I'd like to invite our younger disciples to come forward and join me for our children's moment. Welcome, welcome. You can come up and sit here if you would. How are you this morning? Good to see everybody. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? So I'm going to need you to help me out if you don't mind. Because what we're going to talk about is the same thing we talked about in chapel this week, right? Do you remember what the letter was you learned in preschool this week? T. T. It was a letter T. <laughs> and we talked about in chapel tabernacle, and we talked about temple. Right? And while we talked about that was we were trying to talk about where is it that God lives. Okay? And so we talked about in the Old Testament when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, God gave them instructions to build this big old tent called a tabernacle. Okay? And any time they would stop, they would erect the tabernacle, and inside was the Ark of the Covenant where they thought God lived. Okay? That's where God was. Well, then once the Israelites got to the Promised Land, God told Solomon, okay, now that you have landed where you're supposed to be, you can build something that never moves. And that's where I'll be. And that was the temple. Okay? And so all the Israelites thought God lived just in that temple. In fact, they had a big curtain that they called the Holy of Holies. Behind that is where they thought God lived. Well, there were some folks that didn't particularly care for the Israelites very much. And they ran them out of Jerusalem. So they were exiled. But God told the prophet Ezekiel, said, don't worry about it. Because there's going to come a day when there's going to be another temple, but this temple is going to be one that flows with living water. And this temple is going to make sure that our, my presence with you never, ever goes away again. He was referring to Jesus, okay? So when Jesus comes, Jesus gives us an opportunity to now have a relationship with God. And in fact, the Apostle Paul tells us roughly that our bodies then become temples where the Holy Spirit resides and dwells. 
So to answer the question about where does God live, God lives inside each and every one of you, lives inside me, and also lives inside each and every person that's here in the congregation, and each and every person that's watching us online. God lives inside of you. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have your own room at your house? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever been told at one time or another, your room is a mess? All right. <laughs> then how many of you have ever been told, you need to clean up your room? All right. And then how many of you have ever been told, you need to straighten up your room? All right, all of us. All right, so if God lives inside each and every one of us, then doesn't it not make sense that God wants to live somewhere that is clean and straightened up? Right? Doesn't that make sense? So how do you think it is that we make sure that our bodies, our temples, where God is, stay clean and straightened up? Any idea? How do we make sure that our insides are cleaned and straightened up? One way is to listen to what Jesus tells us in Scripture. Right? Another way is to listen to what God tells us in Scripture. Another way is to listen to what our teachers tell us and what our parents tell us about how to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and also to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Have you heard that before? If we do the things that are asked of us in Scripture, then we can make sure that our hearts and minds, our souls, stay clean and neat and tidy for Jesus. Now, do you see what's going on behind us up here? The first Sunday of every month, we have what's called Holy Communion. That's where we get together as one big family. We take a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice, and we take it in, right? Jesus told his disciples that every time we do that, we're supposed to remember that he is here and present with us. Part of that is also we ask Jesus to maybe forgive us for the things that we didn't do quite right, those things that maybe allowed our hearts and minds to get a little bit messy. And so when we come and take communion, this is a chance for us to make sure we leave church, leave worship, with clean hearts, clean minds, and eyes set upon Jesus. So think about when we take communion here in a little bit, all we're doing is, part of it, is we're cleaning our rooms, right? We're straightening our rooms to make them right for God. Okay? All right, let's have a prayer. God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for sending Jesus, and we thank you for the words as contained in Scripture that gives us reminders of how to keep our hearts and minds clean and tidy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, you can go back to your seats. This morning's gospel reading comes to us from Romans 8 through 13. It's a personal favorite of mine, and I believe it may be the probably second most important lesson in the Bible. The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we have, I'm sorry, that we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Chip. Friends, as we come now to our time of prayer for and with one another, just a few quick reminders that in each and every pew is one of these prayer request cards where if there is somebody that you want this church to be praying for, I encourage you to fill one of these cards out and then put them in one of the two offering boxes after worship has concluded. 
But again, if it's something that's personal, something that's private, something you want to be shared just between you and I, I encourage you to still fill this card out, but then put it in my hand or drop it on my desk uh, after we uh, conclude our worship time. If you're watching us online and you have a prayer request or something that you need, I encourage you to also type it into the comments section because we certainly go back through and read each and every one of them to make sure that all the cares and concerns of our congregation, both near and far, are taken care of. Our prayer this morning is a response of prayer. You'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And if you feel so led, I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll respond by saying, Toward the end of our time together is a space of silence where if there is someone that you want to lift aloud, please do so. If it's something you want to take to the Lord silently, that space will be available to you as well. And do know that both before, during, and after worship, our altar is always open. For those who may want to come down and pray in that fashion. For friends, let us now put our hearts and minds together and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we sometimes forget that when Jesus was tempted by Satan, it was a real battle. We forget that he didn't cash in on his divinity. We think it was easy for him, as if that excuses us when we give in to temptation. Have mercy on us. Give us faith, courage, and endurance. Set your word in our hearts and on our lips, so even in times of trial, we confess and bless our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church throughout the world. Lord, purify, heal, unite, and guide it. Through it, lead many to the foot of Jesus' life-giving cross. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who are persecuted on account of Jesus. Lord, strengthen them in their trials by your strong word. We also pray for teachers and pastors, evangelists and missionaries, discipleship partners, and spiritual guides. Let that same word dwell in their hearts and be confessed by their lips. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation. Lord, keep us steadfast in faith, humble in service, diligent in worship, persistent in prayer, and loving in fellowship. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our children. Lord, set your angels around them. Shield them from evil, deliver them from danger, and guide them in the way of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our broken world. Lord, heal and transform it. We pray for our leaders. Lord, grant them wisdom, justice, and compassion. We pray for all people. Lord, deliver us all from evil. Strengthen us in every good gift and bestow your peace among us all, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all whose work is difficult and dangerous. Lord, give them cool heads, wise words, and right actions. Shield, support, and strengthen those who fall, and support those who await their loved one's return. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick and the injured, the abused and their abusers, the despairing and the confused, the homeless, imprisoned, abandoned and oppressed, the dying and the bereaved, and for all who cry out for mercy, including those we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts.
Lord, save them from their time of trial, deliver them from evil, and bestow upon them the riches of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. With grateful hearts, we entrust our beloved dead into your keeping, dear Lord. Hear us now as we pray for ourselves. Throughout the Lenten pilgrimage of our lives, be the bread for our journey. Forgive us and make us eager to forgive each other. Strengthen us in times of trial. Deliver us from the power of the evil one. Bring us safely into your house, prepared for all who love you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us, gracious Father, for the sake of your well-beloved Son, who intercedes for us before your throne of mercy, and whose name we all say, Amen. Friends, our sermon text this morning from, comes from the Gospel of Luke. We're in the fourth chapter. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 13. So again, this is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation... He departed from him until an opportune time. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, if you are reading along, whether a physical Bible or the Bible app on your phone, I want you to keep it out real quick. I want you to keep it out. I want you to go back to see what the words were at the very end of chapter 3 that come right before what we read in chapter 4. The words immediately before Jesus entering the wilderness are, at least in my translation, the son of Adam, the son of God. The son of Adam, the son of God. You see, the verses in chapter 3, starting at verse 23, are the genealogy of our Lord. It's the exact opposite of Matthew's genealogy. Matthew starts at Abraham and then comes down to Mary and Joseph. Here Luke starts at Joseph and then goes backwards all the way to the beginning. But I think it's interesting to note that right before Jesus heads into the wilderness and faces the devil's temptations that we are told he was the son of Adam, the son of God. Why is that interesting, you might ask? Because that means that, friends, we can not only read Jesus' 40 days of trials in the wilderness alongside the 40-year trek in the wilderness by the nation of Israel, which is what I would imagine you have always heard this sermon preached about, but we can also read Jesus' temptations here alongside with Adam and Eve's temptations in the garden. I honestly hadn't thought about this comparison until I read a commentary this week by a preacher named Chelsea Harmon. Because when you compare the scenes in the garden with the scenes that happen here in the wilderness, the comparisons are fairly eye-opening. Adam and Eve were in a lush garden. 
living with abundance, with peace and authority over every animal that walked the earth. Jesus, on the other hand, is in the desolate wilderness, not eating a thing, subjected to the dangers of the beasts. Simply based on these circumstances alone, Adam and Eve clearly have the upper hand of having their basic needs of food and shelter and safety guaranteed, so surely this would help them resist temptation, right? You and I know the answer. And it's not just with Adam and Eve, because even in the best of circumstances, with everything we could possibly need, we humans have a poor track record when it comes to resisting temptation. In both the garden and in the wilderness, the devil uses God's very own words as the basis of his ploys. The difference between how humanity and Christ Jesus responds when facing temptation, the clear indicator of whether or not they will fail and give in to temptation is whether or not they know the meaning of those words and, more importantly, trust the one behind them. Adam and Eve knew the words that God spoke, the words that commanded them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But when the devil, in the form of a serpent, turned those words back to them, they didn't even think about God, bless you. They didn't think about God and all that God had already proven to them about his care and his provision for them. They didn't trust God. Instead, they thought about having more. And so, even in paradise, temptation comes and we give in. As we see in the garden, the sad irony, friends, is that what is promised to you and I often becomes the very reason why we give in to temptation. Adam and Eve already had everything they could ever need, and yet they gave in to temptation. Why? Because they believed that what the serpent promised would give them more of what God had already provided for them. And God had provided for them everything they could ever need, and yet that wasn't enough. They didn't trust that God had given them enough, and so they wanted more. So the question for us this morning, friends, do you want more? I don't know what your more is, but I imagine that for all of us there is something in our lives that we want more of. I pray that it is more of Jesus, but like you and I talked about last week, we all need to take an inventory of our lives and figure out if there are people and things we put on the same level as or higher than Jesus. Are there things in our lives as important as or more important than our relationship with Jesus? Friends, deep down, if you are being honest, what is it in your life right now that you want more of? In our reading this morning in the wilderness with Jesus, the devil tries to play the exact same game, the same tactics. I mean, it worked with the first Adam, so why would it not work with the second Adam? The devil seems here to be a one-trick pony. At first, he, the tempter urges him to use his divine power to satisfy his bodily desires. You can't trust God to take care of you, he seems to be saying. Why wait? Why starve? You can take care of your wants right now on your own. You don't need God. How often are we focused more on what we want? than in trusting God to provide what we need. Having failed at his first attempt, the devil shifts to what might be our greatest temptation, power. The enemy tries to persuade Jesus to grasp at worldly power by unlawful means. He asks for a small concession, but then offers a large promise. Do this one little thing, Jesus. Just worship me, and I will give you the whole world. How often are we tempted by or engage in seemingly little acts of disobedience, trusting we can get away with it in order to obtain for ourselves more of what we want? And finally, the devil tempts Jesus to manipulate God, to jump from the temple and let the angels save him. 
This temptation to call on God and to avoid suffering death is the same that Jesus will face toward the end of his earthly ministry. He resists now and will do so again then because this is a test of God's promise of protection. How often do we trust ourselves more because of what we can see and control and trust God less because of those things we can't? It's interesting that the devil's choices of temptations here, they're not out of thin air. They're all things that truly and rightly belong to Jesus, and they are things that God promises and guarantees to be part of Christ's glory. Jesus already has ultimate authority and power. It's been given to him by the Father. He can work miracles if he trusts God, and the devil wants him to exploit that power for more power. Jesus is already the prince of peace and ruler of all the kingdoms of the world if he trusts God, yet the devil wants him to abuse that power for his own pleasure, more pleasure. Jesus is the beloved son of God in whom the father is well pleased, and he has the father's heart if he trusts God, yet the devil wants him to distrust that love and make the father prove it, more Basically, the devil is trying to tempt Jesus to do what he did when the devil first rebelled. The devil is trying to talk Jesus into the lies that the devil is clinging to. The devil is tempting Jesus to go after what already belongs to Jesus and what will always be his. He just wants him to do it a little quicker on a different timetable than God's plan. In other words, the devil wants Jesus to fall into the same trap as Adam and Eve, to not trust God, God's timing, God's plan, God's wisdom, God's promises, God's love, God's mercy, and God's hope. And 2,000 years later, friends, the devil does the same thing to you and to me. Bless you. Now, our lives are not lived in the Garden of Eden. And I dare say neither are we wandering in the desert wilderness. But I do think we all live somewhere in between. Our lives are those that vary between joys and sorrows, plenty and want, contentment and worry, addiction and recovery, temptation and sin. And in every season, while we are certainly aware of the presence of God, we are also in every season, unfortunately, also subject to the tempter. If we get too close to God, he's there to try and knock us back. If we get too low, he's there to put his foot on us to keep us down. And in the planes of life, he lingers around at arm's length so we forget that he's around and he can catch us slipping or sleeping. So how do we cope? How do we fight? How do we withstand temptation and make sure that it does not lead us down the path of sin? Well, the answer, at least from our text, would appear to be Scripture, doesn't it? Each time Jesus was tempted, his answer was couched in Scripture. He stood on God's word that he knew and had them at the ready, much like a gunslinger with quick access to his pistol. Our dear friend J.C. Ryle writes this, We ought to be diligent Bible readers because the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We shall never fight a good fight if we do not use it as our principal weapon. It may well be feared that there is not enough Bible reading among us. It may well be feared that there is not enough Bible reading among us. I had the privilege of attending a gathering of the Outer Banks Sportsman's Fellowship this past Thursday night. A number of the men here at this church attend on a regular basis, and it was a great time. Great not because they fed us ribeyes and baked potatoes, Great, not because they serve some of the best banana pudding you will ever have, and I know because I had a second one just to make sure the first one was as good as I thought it was. It was great because almost everywhere you looked, you saw a man carrying around a Bible. Everywhere you looked, you could see a few gathered around the open pages of Scripture. Friends, we all need to be reading our Bibles and be familiar with the Word of God. But friends, that's not enough. 
It's not enough to read and know and be able to quote Scripture. It's not enough that you have a few Bible verses memorized that can spout them off at the drop of a hat because I don't know if you have noticed or not, but in our story this morning, Jesus wasn't the only one that was quoting Scripture. Verses 9 through 11 shows us that Satan himself has also read it, has also memorized it, and is able to use it at the drop of a hat. But Jesus not only knows the words of Scripture, he knows and trusts the one who inspired them. Jesus knows what they mean and what their infallible message is. And of the two quoting Scripture, only one of them is being led by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, friends, you may know the words of Scripture. You may have a Bible reading plan and a daily devotion and highlights and notes all over your Bible, but do you trust the words of Scripture? When you read that God promises you protection and love and life abundant, do you have faith in and trust in it? In the face of temptation, when you may be at your weakest, feeling assaulted from all sides by strife and difficulty, do you still trust in God's Word? Again, from J.C. Ryle, it is not enough to have the book. We must actually read it and pray over it ourselves. It will do us no good if it only lies still in our houses. Knowledge of the Bible can only be got by hard, regular, daily, attentive wakeful reading. I'm going to have to disagree ever so slightly with my buddy here. Because simply hard, regular, daily, attentive, wakeful reading is not going to do it. Instead, it has to be hard, regular, daily, attentive, wakeful reading empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have got to get into the practice of inviting the Holy Spirit to be present with us when we read Scripture and leaning on Him to open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to what we need to take from it. Again, both Jesus and Satan quote Scripture in our story. They both had verses memorized and ready. But you see, Scripture, scripture can be used properly and Scripture can be misused. Friends, faithful interpretation of Scripture is dynamic and occurs only under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley said the Spirit of God not only once inspired those who wrote it, but continually inspires, supernaturally assists those that read it with earnest prayer. Jesus in our story spends 40 days in prayer under the guidance of the Spirit and then faithfully interprets Scripture in order to resist temptation. You see it now. This is how we arm ourselves to resist temptation. Spending our days in prayer, opening ourselves up to be led by the Holy Spirit, then able to faithfully see, feel, believe, and trust in Scripture all in order to resist temptation. As we enter into this season of Lent, this time of trial that Jesus endured on our behalf, it both reminds us of why the incarnation and cross are necessary, and it becomes for us a source of strength. We too can call upon the Holy Spirit to make us more like Christ, able to resist temptation. We too can commit ourselves to disciplines that help us to know God's or the Spirit's infilling. We too can sacrifice and trust that God's words and work are true and all we need. We can deny the devil and his promises of more and pursue the wisdom ways of God. None of this, though, is easy. But Lent becomes about trying to do that very thing. It becomes about recognizing our weaknesses and need for God's intervention. It is about honestly and truthfully identifying and then addressing our own proclivities for wilderness temptations. And it is about asking the Spirit to fill you with the same strength and faith of Christ in order to face them and say no to the devil and his ways. That's why on Ash Wednesday, for those that came, when I made the mark of the cross with ashes on your foreheads, I said, repent and believe the good news. 
Other churches use from dust you came, from dust you shall return. I prefer repent and believe the good news. Why? Well, yes, Lent is a period of acknowledging our sins. Yes, Lent is a period of dedicating our lives back to God. But my friends, while we are working on those areas that need to be straightened out and strengthened up, let us not forget that we don't go at it alone. By our side is the one that suffered temptation so he can know what you and I go through. By our side is the one that suffered death so that we wouldn't be punished. By our side is the one that rose again so we can spend eternity in paradise. Yes, friends, Jesus was alone with the devil in the wilderness, but you will never be so long as you trust and believe. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we come now to our time of reflection upon God's goodness in each and every one of our lives. I just want to remind that there are two offering boxes on each side of the sanctuary. If you were uh, discerning bringing a tithe, the gift, or an offering to church this morning and have not yet put it in the box, I encourage you to do so once worship has concluded. But friends, that it is in honest and heartfelt appreciation of your continued past giving and in anticipation of future gifts, that I'd like for us all to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Let us pray. Mighty God, as we remember the strength of Jesus facing the temptation offered by the devil, we remember too clearly how the temptations of food, of authority, and power have overcome us. We've been tricked to believe our wants were needs and more is always better. May we offer our gifts to you this day with generosity and gratitude. Strengthen us to resist temptation that would present security or power in anyone but you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to stand as you're able now and join me as we sing our song of reflection. It's found on page 630 of the hymnal, page 630. Become to us the living bread, page 630. As I mentioned with our younger disciples, today is a communion Sunday. Our liturgy begins on page 12 of our hymnal, if you care to follow along. We'll start there. We will pray a prayer of confession together. And then our liturgy will begin again on page 14. Remember that here our table is open to everybody. You don't have to be a member. You can have questions, you can have concerns, but the table is open to everybody who wants to come forth and partake in the sacrament.
Friends, our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us all confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My dear friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving just how much God loves each and every one of us. And so in the name of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, Glory to you in the highest and peace to your people on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of a stable Jesus was born, so by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. As your word became flesh, born of a woman on that night so long ago, so in the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, now as the reconciled and forgiven sons and daughters of the Most High, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, we are many persons. But though we are many, we make up one body. That one body being the body of Christ. The body of the sinless, perfect one. Broken. So that you and I who are broken can be put together again and made whole. This cup of salvation over which we give thanks, this is the blood of our Savior. Poured out for you and for me for forgiveness of all of our sins. For well, those that are assisting with communion this morning, please come forward. little kind of crook right here like right there on the on the floor and you guys will do the same on that side so my friends we have two stations here this morning uh, this section you'll come through this inside aisle you'll take a piece of bread you'll take a cup and you can either Take it there as you stand, or you can come to the altar and kneel. Once you're done, it, you'll place your cup in one of the cup holders here up by the altar. You guys do the same thing, but obviously opposite. You'll come this inside aisle and then leave this way. And then, friends, once both the wings have gone, then it's your turn. And I guess, Angie, you might be the dividing line here. So if you're Angie on this side, you come this way. And then, Lee, uh, you, you guys come come this way. If you need a gluten-free option, we have gluten-free up here as well. If you do choose to come to the altar rail and pray, please know you stay there as long as you find need. But I invite you now to come forward as you feel so led for Holy Communion.
go with him with him all the way I can hear my Savior calling I can hear my Savior calling I can hear
Friends, I want to invite you to stand as you're able and join me as we sing our closing hymn, page 156. I love to tell the story, page 156. Friends, our temples are now straightened up and cleaned up. But once we walk out these doors, we're going to be hit with temptation. As we go forth this week, pray. Open yourselves up to the Holy Spirit. Read Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that you need to know. That way you can discern what is temptation and stay away from it. We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen.